My name is Avnish Pandya and I am representing the Bombay Hemp Company. Uh, we started in 2013. Uh, I am going to take you through the journey of the company, uh, talking about some thought provoking things like cannabis, which is such a hot topic around. Uh, breaking some myths, understanding a little bit more science about it and definitely talking about its application. So, Bombay Hemp Company, the, the thought process of creating a company in agriculture, doing something with a crop or doing something in the rural area actually began back in college. Uh, all seven co-founders were part of this uh, club called SIFE, Students in Free Enterprise. And uh, the the basic concept of the organization was to come up with solutions that would be something between what we today call socialism and what we today call capitalism. Something that would be a good blend where you could actually profit from something that would benefit somebody else as well. Where profit is a motive definitely because anyone would want to function like a limited company. But how can we portray it in a way and create people's betterment at the center of it? And the first project that we actually came up with was Project Chirag. It was uh, a solar rural electrification project. Today this project has gone ahead and lit over 1200 villages in India. And we came up with a very simple business model. We said the only way people who are off the grid will get on the grid if they have some kind of solar equipment. Because we can't be waiting for the government to build infrastructure so that the grids reach them. We did a detailed survey of the kind of solar products that were available back in the day. And the most important thing that I think we created in the process was not the solar lantern because we weren't scientists, uh, not, not how it would be applied because we didn't know how village infrastructure worked, but we developed a financial product around it. We said that if we could subsidize the price of the solar uh, powered thing by 50%, then we would be able to help them raise 50% of the money. We don't give it to them for free because the moment we give something to somebody for free, we definitely don't value it. And the other 50% will be something that they will pay through EMIs. So they value the product, they get a product for cheap and they actually get light, which is the bigger consequence in the whole thing. Today Project Chirag is an NGO in itself and is, is working with villages in Uttar Pradesh, Rajasthan, Maharashtra and Karnataka as well. During our visits to all these different places, including Uttarakhand, Himachal Pradesh, we realized that a lot of people in our country work in this sector. And just to give you a glimpse of how much it would be, just a couple of years ago, the statistic was 60% in agriculture and allied industries related to agriculture. That would be semi-processing, post-processing, machinery, labor, etc., etc. And what is its contribution to uh, this thing called GDP, right? We, we talk about the GDP a lot and it's definitely not an efficient ratio. And why is it not an efficient ratio? And very simple questions through our visit because some of us were economic students, some of us were marketing students. We were learning about rural marketing. So it was just due to our travels and our experiences, we realized that there is this whole parallel world out there that we have no idea about. Uh, when I was just walking through the door, I realized, damn, we don't have network inside the auditorium. So that's the kind of first world problem we have. And when we walk into a village, uh, we, see, we see things that we never imagined and the way people are living, the way people even go about their daily routine, what they eat, how they live. So this difference created this whole uh, questionnaire in our mind that how does this happen and why is this in this way. We ended up learning a lot about the basic problems that we face and I'll give you a very simple example. India is one of the world's biggest growers of wheat today. But do you know more than 300,000 tons of our wheat just goes waste for one simple reason because we don't have enough gunny bags to bag those wheat, uh, that much amount of wheat. So we're dealing with a problem that is just not a uniform problem. It, it exists at multiple levels. And how could we possibly, as a bunch of people, influence a value chain that employs 60% of our country? That was the challenge that was set in front of us. And we knew that we couldn't just step out of college and create an amazing company because I hope it worked that way, but it really doesn't. We need real-world experience. We need to have real jobs. We need to see how money works. 
we need to understand how products work, whether products move or not, and if they don't move, what's the probability of success and failure. So, some of us got jobs with consulting companies, some of us were working with media houses, to get a lot more exposure. And at that point of time, we understood that this whole segment of natural fibers, what today our primary understanding of natural fibers is cotton, is actually a very underutilized market in India. When we talk about bamboo, when we talk about kenaf, when we talk about jute, roselle, these are big fiber crops in India, but we have very, very limited application for these. And once we understood that, okay, there is a lot of application towards these different fibers, we need to have some kind of a team that could actually start off by doing some basic R&D in these different fibers. And the one that we shortlisted to was cannabis. And I'm specifically calling it cannabis because that's the genus the plant comes from. Now, there's a big difference in this preconceived notion that we have of this plant, which would definitely be one of a drug. But it's there are different types of cannabis the same way we have different types of cats. There are cats you domesticate, there are cats that live in your houses, and there are cats you don't. There are cousins of different plants where chocolate and cocaine probably come from the same plant family somewhere because their cocoa and cocoa would be having a similar genetic makeup at some point. But that doesn't mean they're specifically the same plant. And that is exactly the difference between a cannabis indica plant, which would specifically be high in THC, THC being the psychoactive element, the chemical compound that causes that kind of euphoria or the feeling of being stoned, as we would call it. Whereas the hemp plant is extremely low in THC, it's a fibrous variety, it has a lot more seed that it gives and it is used specifically for industrial application. Now hemp was very interesting for us because A, it had a massive history, uh, specifically with any country that ever went to war or ever needed to build a resource quickly, they needed hemp essentially. Whether we're talking about uh, Napoleon's invasion to Russia or we're talking about uh, uh, Hitler fighting the war or America fighting the Second World War. Uh, in fact, hemp uh, has been the oldest cultivated crop uh, known to mankind. It's since more than 6,000 years ago we've been cultivating hemp and we've been using it for a lot of different purposes. Uh, in fact, Henry Ford's first car, the T model, was designed around hemp fibers and was pro uh, proclaimed to be 10 times stronger than steel. It was also designed to run on hemp fuel. Uh, a lot of different nuclear disasters across the world uh, that have completely left the soil uh, in an unusable condition. There's a, a specific term in science which we call phytoremediation. So we are remediating the soil using hemp because of its root structure and the way it can get rid of the toxins in the soil. Some of the bigger car companies in the world, specifically from Europe, uh, work with hemp. Uh, all their internal car paneling is actually made from hemp fiber. And it would be a shock, right, that all, everything we considered about cannabis that would be a drug would actually be present in a car that way. Uh, currently, hemp is a $38 billion uh, global industry, primarily based out of the US, China, and Europe. It's definitely coming up in India with all the research that we are doing. Hemp can make specific grades of graphene like carbon. At the same time, cannabis is currently being studied as a medicine in different countries and what is happening with it. A range of big companies as all the consumer companies that we would call already work with hemp. And we have a very good example with the body shop. So while me and a few of my colleagues were traveling in Uttarakhand, we saw this female use hemp seed oil because hemp is a native crop of Uttarakhand. And uh, she was using this hemp seed oil to get rid of her stretch marks. And she was applying it on her skin and everywhere. And we just happened to ask the locals, what oil is this? Why are you applying this oil? And they said this specific oil helps them in remediating their skin, the dead DNA, and helping them regenerate their DNA in some way. And then we come back to Delhi together, train back to Bombay, and we, in Delhi, we in a shopping mall, we see hemp based moisturizing creams by the body shop. And that was the aha moment that there are people in our villages who know of all these amazing things because of their indigenous techniques. And we have Western big businesses who've been able to actually put that and box it in a product uh, which we buy aspirationally. 
So that whole transition of what indigenously exists to how uh, how a Western concept is modified, because I come from a marketing background, so that's an important thing for me. How it is modified and sold out. Like when we were told to have haldi ka do at home when we were young, we used to you know, say, no mom, I'm not going to have it. But today we have uh, some of our colleagues traveling different parts of the world and turmeric latte is so much better than haldi ka dood, So This was one of, one of those aha moments of realization that how some of our indigenous things are maybe what these big companies are copying. And then we actually break down what are the total number of uses that hemp has. Because of its nature as a seed and a fiber crop, it can be applied in a host of industries. And India definitely has a lot of its own wild and feral hemp. But we don't have our own standardized versions of hemp. Like we have standardized varieties of rice, we have standardized varieties of wheat, because these are cultivated crops. Hemp is primarily a wild and feral crop, which now we're bringing to more of a domesticated manner. As, as we talk about different countries and different economies, we can look at China, which is one of the world's biggest hemp growers. More than two and a half million Chinese farmers grow hemp. Uh, hemp is one of the biggest commodities that is single-handedly procured by the Chinese PLA because of its fiber applications. Their bed linen, their socks, their clothes, everything is made from hemp. Uh, some of the bigger uh, fashion brands in Italy definitely grow their own hemp because they process it as textiles. So the shirt I'm wearing currently is a 100% hemp shirt. It's made from the past fiber of hemp. Uh, Countries like Slovenia use hemp as a source of pulp uh, because it has a high cellulose content. As we see big brands like H&M now are getting into working with sustainable fabrics like hemp because just to give you a perspective, hemp grows in 90 days, whereas cotton takes around seven months to completely harvest. Hemp takes a thousand times less of water to grow because it's literally a weed crop. So you're literally growing weed crops. And it gives you fine quality fi uh, fiber, just like flax or linen, which today is one of the most uh, expensive fabrics that's available within the natural fiber segment. Uh, companies like H&M, uh, even CNA globally are looking at a sustainable mandate with uh, textiles that would not be so cotton intensive because cotton is a sucker to the economy. It's, it's the use of pesticide, the use of water, and we're realizing that with the water table drastically going away. Uh, hemp is also being used in new age materials. I just mentioned supercapacitors. Now it's being uh, used specifically in plastics. Uh, I was talking about batteries and how the hemp fibers can, can produce amazing grade activated carbon. As I said, Indian farmers already have a lot of hemp. Specifically, in, if we talk about a certain latitude of northern India, hemp is a very wild and feral crop. You will find it in most places, it grows like a weed. All we're doing as an organization is putting it through the scientific process of what is the difference between cannabis and hemp and explaining that to the government. Because the government is one of our most key stakeholders in what we're doing. What we term ourselves as is a regulatory enterprise. We're betting the future of our enterprise on the ability of the government to understand the difference between different species that has been identified globally by different mandates and also been defined by the United Nations Convention on the same. So it's not just about us creating one product or us trying to sell fabric or fibers. It's just not that one thing. And that's the biggest mistake people make when, when they want to start off a company. And this is one thing even we learned gradually. That you, whenever you start off with something, first you create a platform for yourself. You cannot just one day get up. However amazing your product is, you do not have the distribution, you do not have the understanding of business, you do not know how much money you, will, you would need to get that out. You need to create an ecosystem for yourself. And that ecosystem is usually validated by the following people that we've mentioned here. The first one and the most important one is, is the kind of company you're trying to make actually exist somewhere else? Does, is it happening or is it like you're living in an illusion that this might happen? There's a reality and global hemp companies exist and what do they do? How do they make money? How do they help their farmers? How are they helping the environment? 
Then is the government and policy makers. Because it comes from the same plant family as cannabis, it's still regulated. So how do we work with a regulated commodity which is actually very beneficial as well? So showcasing the right kind of picture towards these policy makers. And of course these policy makers are going to rely very heavily on scientists and researchers because we're a private limited company that can have a deeper ulterior motive to make money but of course our scientists need to validate every claim that we have. Uh, then come the actual farmer who's going to benefit the most from this because he's going to get a crop he can grow very quickly, does not need too much input cost, can harvest it and has a ready buyer. So we're creating a simple agriculture technology system where we know what our farmer is going to grow and we know what we can buy it at. We're making supply and demand more reliable by actually having contracts with the farmers. We're treating them as business partners and not specifically as just somebody that we need to take care of. Uh, then comes the industry partners supporting, of course, all the raw material that we're working with. We need big industry to actually buy that raw material. There's only that much that a small company like us can do. We need to get big serious players involved in this system. So hemp can do all the thousand things, but we're only concentrating on the three most important ones. The three things that we actually need to survive, that is food, clothing and shelter. This, this crop can provide us with all these different things, specifically when we're talking about food, it provides us with some of the highest grade omega-3, 6 and 9 essential fatty acids within any essential oil that is available there. It's much better in comparison to flax and other seed oils present. Protein hemp has the highest amount of soluble protein uh, per 100 grams. Uh, soy has the highest amount of protein, but uh, hemp is a protein called edistine, which is highly soluble uh, within the system. Uh, definitely hemp is becoming a big uh, product in the superfood category globally along with flax, quinoa, chia and a lot of others. Uh, clothing, as, I'm, as I told you, I'm wearing a hemp shirt. There are a lot of different variants of hemp that are present, different blends. You can blend it with silk, you can blend it with yak hair, you can blend it with cotton, a lot of different fibers you can blend it with. Uh, hemp currently is 2-3% to 3 of the world's textile market, so it is definitely a small niche. But China is picking up, European countries are picking up, and it's time for India to begin doing something as there. So the herd, herd fiber, which is like the soft wood of the plant, can be chipped and mixed with the right kind of lime aggregate to create an amazing building material. We are doing this project with IIT uh, in Delhi right now and processing the fiber to create a building aggregate that would actually absorb carbon. So we have a carbon negative home that is actually absorbing carbon, imp improving thermal efficiency and all of this is from literally agriculture waste. Because of uh, the nature of our work where we are dealing with this questionable commodity in some way, uh, we, we have been quite present in the news and the media and we've actually been invited by a lot of different state governments to talk about hemp and cannabis and uh, definitely the two to three state governments that would come to mind are Himachal Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir and Uttarakhand. These three states have widely growing cannabis either cultivated by the locals for their indigenous uses or uh, harvested by the farmer from the wild. And they wanted to understand that there is a big drug problem with this. How can we deal with this drug problem? Because overnight you cannot replace a crop. Yes, we understand that people in the mountains do make some things out of it which are sold in the black market as narcotics. And that's a very established fact. But the reality of the fact is you can't get rid of it overnight. And you cannot cut all those plants away because there are millions of hectares of that. So you better be able to find a real use to it rather than thinking of it as your only problem. Because sometimes the way you have to look at the solution is the way the problem is structured. If you cannot change the whole problem, then you've got to probably change the way you look at it. And that's what we did with a lot of different state governments. Today, the state government of Uttarakhand, with all the power of science and the power of persuasion we had, the state government of Uttarakhand actually has a proper policy for its farmers to grow hemp that the genetics have to be studied by a state government research institute, they have to be approved and then that approved model can then be given to the farmer and he can scale it up. And this system was created after two to three years of deepened understanding of how the Chinese are working with their farmers because it still could be that the question is, okay, what if somebody grows an actual cannabis plant in the middle of all these plants, then what will you do? 
But that's scientifically proven that the genetics that we are providing for our farmers to grow this crop would not create those cannabinoids. So we're dealing with something that's scientifically proven and safe enough. This is some of my colleagues with uh, the then Chief Minister, Mr. Harish Rawat, in the state. Now, because we're working with such a questionable commodity again, uh, the important viewpoint of different government think tanks and stakeholders is also very important. We were privileged enough to meet with Dr. Bibek Debroy, who's uh, a permanent member on Niti Aayog, which is uh, India's premier think tank. And we had a conversation with him about on the kind of work we are doing. And uh, post our conversation with him, he actually came out with his own uh, op-ed in the Indian Express called The Cannabis Dilemma. And he specifically talks about how we really need to look at cannabis in a different way. Yes, it has been a problem, it is a drug menace, but there are good uses to this plant and how can we bring the good uses to this uh, plant in the forefront. And another big supporter uh, in the same way turned out to be uh, Mr. Tathagat Satpati. He's currently a member of parliament from Odisha. And uh, we just wanted to understand that what do our parliamentarians think of hemp? You know, they come from a lot of constituencies that grow bhang locally. So they would be very acquainted with what hemp is. And uh, to our surprise, uh, when we gifted Mr. Satpati a small kurta, when he wore it to the parliament, he actually spoke about it. And we had 15 other parliamentarians wanting to wear a hemp kurta because there was local bhang that grew in their village. And they had no idea that this fiber could actually make them something useful. And that's how slowly we're seeding a bigger thought into these people. We're influencing policy while we're working at a very, very small level. None of us have any political influence, but one thing we did take time to understand is how our bureaucracy works. Because all of us spend time, you know, thinking uh, extremely critically about how we are so corrupt and how everything is so difficult to do. Definitely it is difficult to do. Because you have an opportunity to serve 1.3 billion people, I think they have every right to be difficult to you. And if you can get in through the right channels, you can influence the right kind of people. Because there's always a bureaucrat who will understand your language. If you are educated, so is the bureaucrat an educated guy, and he just needs to understand it from his perspective. And as we heard in the previous talk about givers and takers, it's a lot related to that concept as well. That's how we began working with a lot of different government ministries. For a startup company to work with so many different government ministries is unheard of. But today we have a network, uh, today, today we have a network of bureaucrats ranging from the Indian administrative services to revenue services, we have people, including members of parliaments and bureaucrats within states who know what hemp is, who are working on policies related to hemp. And why are we actually doing all of this? Why, what is the ulterior motive? And we try to sum it up in a very simple way. We, we, we split all our efforts in three directions. Uh, the first one being the community, the second one being the environment, and the third one being profit. Companies of tomorrow are not going to be built the way companies of yesterday's were. We have different metrics to adjudge our success and shareholders profit is not the first one. And so happens that we're a private limited company, we're not an NGO, we don't do this because we just feel good about it. We actually want to create a sustainable business. And some of us have also had experience in the NGO space and it's really difficult to have a sustainable flow of funding till you don't have impacts, actually impacting people's lives and some people have already experienced that in that case. So very simple motive, before we actually started growing hemp and everything, the first thing we did is we started helping a bunch of weavers in Uttarakhand to start weaving hemp so that we can spread the message of hemp by, which is written by these local weavers using their own Bageshwari charkhas and spreading the message out. And we could not do all of this till we did not actually get some grey hair experience on board. Because it's not just that seven of us envisioned this and we had, we had the political tact and understanding of how we talk to bureaucrats, how we work with them. We could not have generated that knowledge amongst self. It was very important for us to get people who've done real stuff in their lives, who have that kind of positive influence and say in policy and also understand the impact of something like this at a multi-fold level. And as you see, some of these people 
are extremely well positioned in their careers to be able to offer assistance to companies like ours. Then we actually did a simple exercise with the Ministry of Textiles. The report is going to be soon released. What is the benefit of hemp to the Indian economy? And we said that, okay, hemp might have multifold uses, but let's just concentrate on one industry and try to value it. I think this number is around 240 crores. Only if we use hemp that is limited to the feral quality outside, positively to help our people. And only from one state, which is from the state of Uttarakhand. So the impact is multifold. And the reason why we want to do this is we want to make hemp the next cotton. That is the idea. Cotton is not an indigenous crop. It has come from outside and there is a lot of different vested groups in cotton that are profiting drastically from it. And the whole global supply chain reg with regards to cotton is now facing a massive hit because of the environmental impact it has. And we're just not talking about how big that problem is, but how possible our solution is as well. So, as I told you, like we're treating these people as our partners. They are, we contract them things. We don't just offer them an opportunity. That's not how we want to deal with them. We want to deal with them as equal partners because that's how it should be done. And there are a lot of bigger companies like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, who work with farmers who are creating new business models around agri supply chain. So we're learning from the bigger companies as well. So it's, it's the birth of a new industry. We believe that we're going to spin off a lot of different companies from this. And we know that there are a lot of bigger companies who are interested in working with this as a raw material. So how do we cling uh, the success of our company with the success of these bigger giants who would be invested in making this happen as well? We're that little, little step right now. It's been three years since, uh, we, since we started the company. And so far, we've been able to work with two different state governments to specifically create regulation for their farmers to grow hemp. And of course, both these states originally have an indigenous use of this crop as well. I would just like to leave everyone with one last thought that there are really weird things around you where you can find value. There might be something that irritates you. It might be the doorknob of your house or the way the AC is positioned in your room. But anything can be a problem to any one of us, but there are valuable resources around those problems that exist. And I just want each one of you all to keep your eyes and ears open because you don't know what you will find where and how it will change your life. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you.